Section 5, oxygen sensor test holes. Let's okay. say here's your 800 millivolt line, here's your 200 millivolt line. It's okay if it goes above and below those lines. We just don't want to be inside of there. So if you're inside of that range, then that sensor is probably needing to be replaced. And you don't want to look at it with too much critique. If you look at this picture here, uh, we'll talk about this case study in a second, you can see that this blue trace is hitting 800 millivolts or 0.8, and it's going below 200 millivolts or 0.2. Uh, looking at the red trace on this side, we're not quite hitting that 0.8 number, itself. but it's good enough. Frequency can't be determined using scan data. And the reason why is scan tools report voltage over frame, not voltage over time like a scope does. A, a DSO is going to give you a voltage scale this way and a time scale this way. So on our DSO, we have volts and time. But when you're looking at a scan tool graph, which a lot of people think substitutes the need for a scope, they're wrong. A scan tool graph is going to give you volts over frame. And the one other comment on the scan tool is, let's say your O2 signal is coming in like this. This would be the actual live signal. And then we're looking at it on a graph over here. What's it going to look like? Again, every car is going to sample different. And a lot of them might be something like this. And so the computer is sampling that O2 at different points. And then what it does on a graph is it plays connect the dots. And so our our graph on the scanner looks like that. And you say, well, that's a pretty crappy looking O2. In fact, yesterday when we did one. Tip. But doesn't it help if somebody's teaching you a number and you read this in all the text? If somebody's teaching you a number, an O2 should switch between 1 to 5 hertz or a switch time of less than 100 milliseconds, doesn't it help to see it? And that's all I'm doing. I'm just showing you a bad one. I'm showing you a good one. Okay, page 4, section 5, O2 signal fixed rich. What we're going to cover now is our fixed rich, fixed lean O2 signals, starting with fixed rich. The first thing that we want to ask ourselves always, in all circumstances, when you have a fixed oxygen sensor signal, is we want to make sure that our sensor is reporting accurately. So our first question would be, we want to, in, in this case, fixed rich, ask yourself, is the ratio actually rich, or is the O2 contaminated and reporting a false rich condition? And so I'm giving you two methods to identify that. One would be to make a large vacuum leak, and two would be to compare tailpipe CO percentage with the O2 millivolts. Now I gotta tell you, number one on this, make a large vacuum leak, is not foolproof. Also and for your ASC L1. Your ASC L1, which is your advanced engine performance exam, is heavy, heavy gas analysis. There was a reason why when you had your, your ASC L1, you were able to get your repair technician license and you could write waivers here in Pennsylvania. That ASC L1 certification, you didn't need to take the PA exam. That one superseded that and you were able to get your waiver license with that. They have since dropped that to the A8 engine performance one because I guess nobody could pass the L1. So I'm not sure you know, why they did that, but in any case, let's do a little gas review here. Plug this in. What kind of signal is this? This is the O2 in this picture. This is the O2 signal. What kind of mixture is this sensor reporting? This is a rich signal. And so we want to be careful calling it rich exhaust, right? Even though the O2 is reporting a rich condition, it could be lying. This is a rich signal. Now our question is, is the engine running rich or is the O2 lying? How's my wiring from the computer all the way down to that connector? It's good. And that's what I'm trying to emphasize here is once you know that this is there, we can use this to our advantage to check signal wire integrity. From so I'm going to pause it right there. Notice right off the bat, I mean, you know, I get a lot of questions with this area. Why do you go into so much detail with the bias voltage with the oxygen sensor? And I think the biggest thing is you're going to see it. And when you get to the field, you need to at least have an idea of what you're looking at. This right off the bat counters everything I've told you so far about oxygen sensors. That it's a zero to one volt signal with a 200 to 800 millivolt 
uh, typical range. Look at the four oxygen sensors on this Jeep. Engine's cold. I'm reading five volts on every one of the ground. Let's what? look at another one. Volts lag. It has an O2 code. This was a new oxygen sensor that was put in the car. It was setting the same code. So think about it. Garage owner got an oxygen sensor code, changed the oxygen sensor, still has the same code. So don't you think that in this scenario, your focus is going to be on this O2 and the wiring and what's going on with the, with the circuit very, very close. So I'm looking at this O2 signal, and this is what I see. And I really don't like it. I'm reading 400 to 1,100 millivolts. It looks like it's shifted high to me. And I checked my, my sensor ground, and I read about 300 millivolts on the O2 ground. And what I wanted to see was less than 100 millivolts because that was, is a typical sensor graph. And we covered this again in section three, pulse width modulated solenoids. If you connect a voltmeter up to a pulse width modulated solenoid, you will read an average of that pulse. So we need to take these into account. I'll show you that real quick. This is your average pulsing signal. This would be a vehicle with a power side that's being switched. You see the blue trace is the heater ground. It's hovering around zero volts. The red trace on this picture is my heater power, and it's being switched from zero volts to roughly battery voltage, 14 volts. And you can see that in this top waveform that the average of this is around seven volts. So if you were to connect a multimeter, you didn't have a scope, you connected a multimeter to that heater power circuit, you're gonna see an average of that pulse. This is not a problem. I'm just pointing this out to you guys that, again, down the road, picture the scenario. The vehicle comes in, has an O2 heater circuit fault. If you have a heater circuit code, what's the first thing you should be doing? Checking your power and ground on the O2 heater, making sure it's normal. And your first measurement, you see seven volts on a power feed, immediately you're gonna think you have a problem. It's going to drive the mixture rich and then drive it lean and look at the reaction of the downstream. So let me show you how to create that condition. And I'll show you what I did in these two pictures. It's called an oxygen storage test. Dead cat up top. Bad cat, 420. Here's what you do. You can see that clearly we want the both o twos moving and, and we want uh, the engine hot. We want the cat hot. And this already looks like a bad cat, doesn't it? The downstream sensor looks like the upstream sensor. It should look like this down here. See how the downstream is flat and the upstream is moving? Okay, so this one's already dead just by looking at that, but here's how you do the test. Add propane to the intake. When you add propane to the intake, what's the short-term fuel trim command gonna immediately start to do? It's gonna immediately take fuel away. So is it safe to say while I'm adding propane during this period of time, that the short term has gone way negative, probably full negative. Let's say we've taken away 50% of the fuel during that process. 